Well, welcome everyone. I am Missoula County Commissioner Dave Strohmeyer. Uh, unfortunately, Mayor John Engen, who usually tags team with Missoula County on these uh, daily calls and uh, conferences, is not able to attend today. So I will uh, be leading us through uh, an interview uh, that we have with uh, Amy Allison Thompson, Executive Director of the Poverello Center, and Lori Francis, who's the Executive Director of Partnership Health Center. So today's topic uh, really centers on how these two organizations are working in our community to help some of our most vulnerable population and what steps they're taking to uh, really reach out to and help folks who are experiencing homelessness in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic. So to just kick things off, Amy, uh, why don't we start with you this afternoon and could you just tell us a little bit about uh, uh, why concerned members of our Missoula community might see more folks experiencing street homelessness right now than they would during other times of uh, community emergencies or crises? It's a great question and it's one that we're hearing a lot about. I'm seeing in the news as well that people are, are concerned about the number of people they're seeing sleeping outside right now in our community. I would say that there is a kind of complex answer to that question, but first of all, um, as you can imagine, we do have obviously a shelter in our community, the Pavarello Center. Um, and normally we're able to sleep up to 175 people at a time overnight. And so what we found actually as um, the pandemic started getting closer to Montana, that many of the folks that we were serving were feeling very fearful about actually sleeping in a congregate setting, which makes sense, right? Like, would any of us want to sleep in a room with 56 other people right now? No, and even in the best of circumstances, we probably wouldn't want to. So um, during this pandemic, people are feeling very fearful, and so they're choosing to sleep outside where they can provide themselves with some adequate space away from other people and to attempt to keep themselves safe. Um, in addition to that, we actually just last week at the Pavarello Center implemented a cap on the number of people we can serve to 98 people. And we came to that conclusion um, as I went around the building in all of our sleeping spaces and literally measured six feet between every sleeping space and 98 is the number that we landed on. And so unfortunately at this time, that means if 75 people normally this time last year needed that space, we no longer are providing that space. And so that too means we have no other shelter in our community. So the capacity that we have is low and is gonna to lead to more people experiencing homelessness. And then kind of bigger picture um, around this, um, we anticipate because of people losing their employment, um, uh, it is very possible we're going to see an increase in um, issues around homelessness and food insecurity in our community. So this may be just the beginning of what we see in our community as well. Thanks, Amy. Uh, Lori, I guess a similar question. Are you seeing any difference in the people or uh, uh, clients that Partnership Health is seeing these days? You know, when this all hit, like many of the healthcare entities in town, um, you probably remember, Dave, we see typically 16,000 people a year and about um, 900 visits a week. So when this hit, we changed our whole strategy, just like other healthcare entities, and moved to phone visits and video visits. Uh, the large majority are now um, done through the phone through phone calls. So for help for homeless folks, that means you have to have a phone um, and uh, have a phone with minutes that you can engage in a conversation. So I just got the stats before this video interview just to take a look. Um, we're down 50% on our visits for folks who aren't homeless and also down 50% for folks who are homeless, which means those people, as Amy is suggesting, um, are you know, unable to access shelter easily at the pub rail, but also unable to access primary care as easily as they used to. So we, as a health center, are very concerned about that and looking at strategies to reach out to that group and ensure that they're getting their needs met. All the, and I would add to this, all behavioral health visits currently are done by phone here. Um, we did that within one day of, of deciding to change our strategy. And those same thing, a third of homeless people do not have access to a phone. So we're concerned that they are not getting their needs met. And, and again, Amy sees those, a lot of us in the community see those folks. 
and how we best serve them during this really crazy time is um, is a goal of ours. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for all your work being adaptable, trying to figure this out on the fly here. Um, Amy, we're telling folks in the community to social distance, and I, I can only imagine that in a setting where folks are naturally uh, more tightly congregated, that can be a challenge at, at a place like the POV. So could you talk to us about any steps that you're taking to try to reduce or mitigate the possibility of spread of illness? Yeah, so great question. <clears throat> so like I said before, we sleep up or we were sleeping up to 175 people per night. We also serve from 400 to 600 meals per day. And so if you think about the number of people generally coming in and out of our building, it's a very high number. Um, and some of those folks that access our soup kitchen are not folks that actually stay with us. They're often community members who are coming in to stretch their dollar and have a meal. So what has that has meant for us is we have had to work around the clock to turn, kind of turn all of our policies on their heads. We have shifted protocols in every way we can think of at this time. Um, so as I mentioned before, we've obviously reduced our capacity in general to 98. We have completely overhauled our meal process. So we actually only allow 26 people in our dining room at a time. Our dining room's pretty big, so that works out. We're able to keep people six feet apart during that meal time, but that creates a very complex process where we have folks wait outside and then we, um, you know, kind of one at a time bring folks in um, to access meals. So it's kind of this complex process we're doing. In addition to that, we are working with Partnership Health Center to screen our guests several times a week. And so that's a basic symptom screen. Um, Partnership is doing that um, a couple of times a week. And then our staff, um, if somebody comes in and has not been screened, then our staff are catching those folks as well. So in order to access services in general, you have to actually have been screened for symptoms. Um, so far, that's been effective in um, catching illness early. Um, we have not yet had a positive at the Pavarello Center. Center, um, with a guest or staff member. So we're feeling hopeful about that. But um, we do know that this population will likely be significantly impacted um, by COVID if it does strike the shelter um, in that folks we serve are often older and often have complex medical histories that will be put them into the high risk category. Um, in addition to that, we have implemented significant cleaning protocols. We have a team of staff members and guests that are cleaning six hours a day, just deep cleaning um, our high traffic areas. And that's in addition to the chores that are done by people staying with us. So significant amount of cleaning. Um, also, our homeless outreach team is out on the streets working with folks who are living unsheltered. So as you can imagine, numbers of folks sleeping outside have increased. And so now their time out on the streets doing outreach has increased a lot. Um, so those are some of the kind of bigger pieces that we've done, but I would say we've had to rethink all of our shelter kind of service delivery at this time. Thanks. And if folks didn't catch it, on Monday, April 20th in the Missoulian, there was a great front page story talking about some of the efforts at the POV uh, and challenges related to cleaning and such. So check that out. It was it was a good story. I don't know if you saw that, uh, Lori, today or not, but uh, it's, it's worth checking out. Uh, question for you, Lori. So whether this is uh, the community at large or PHC specifically, how, how have you seen the community come together to support folks, uh, our friends and neighbors who even in the best of circumstances uh, uh, might find challenges in their lives? Well, I think um, Amy did a great job describing our partnership at, um, at the POV. We've been at the POV with a primary care facility for a number of years and most recently started screening all sorts of clients. So anybody who comes to the pub, we were screening, even though they weren't officially our primary care client. client. Um, further, the community has come together. City and county, you guys have been great. I mean, this, I know this isn't a promotion for you, but I would say the county commissioners, the county leadership, the city leadership, uh, city council have been really supportive of ensuring that all people in Missoula uh, have high levels of health and well-being even during this very difficult time. So um, when you think about folks who are homeless or anybody who's living in uh, poverty or less adequate situation, their exposure um, to um, the elements is greater. And um, we don't want that for them and we don't want it for us. And so um, 
Missoula has always been extremely collaborative and I, I feel lucky to work with all the organizations, all of whom had to start walking on their hands after walking on their feet for years. Um, and I think together we are coming up with some really profoundly uh, humane and successful solutions. And I imagine after this all dies down, we will have even uh, more interesting strategies for creating a safety net for all of Missoula. Great. Well, this next question is really for, for both of you, uh, and maybe we'll begin with, uh, with Amy. Uh, how, in your estimation, does COVID-19 compound the physical, mental, emotional challenges uh, when you have stable housing, and how is it even harder uh, if you're experiencing homelessness? Yeah, it's a great question. I think <clears throat> I think any of us um, that are lucky to be at home, um, many of us are counting our lucky stars right now um, if we are able to be home. But I do think, of course, if somebody is um, affected by COVID, it's going to have a significant impact on your life and health. And I think when you think about um, what it might be like to try to manage uh, that type of illness when you're on the streets or the, the fear of, of getting that illness on the streets uh, has a significant impact. Something that people don't often realize, um, folks who are living unsheltered, um, it's hard to understand this, but that experience of being uh, homeless is a traumatic event in itself. And so to add in a pandemic and the fear of becoming ill um, just compounds all of that um, exponentially. And folks that are living on the streets or sleeping outside, um, it's easy to be like, oh, I'm camping, I'm camping. Folks are truly... Um, not sure where their next meal is going to come from. They're not sure if they're going to have shelter that night. Um, and so that experience for a person is a terrifying experience. And it's one that I would not wish on anyone. Lori, anything to, to add there from your perspective? You know, I think the only thing I'd say is we, uh, Amy's group and certainly partnership sees, we see about 300, we have 300 homeless patients that come here regularly to receive services. And that group, that subpopulation is, is there's a, some of the most resilient folks you will find. Like when I consider how it would be to live on the street, sleep under the bridge, it's terrifying. And so this group um, has learned to survive and there's a lot of camaraderie and togetherness and ability to access services, um, which is just profoundly amazing to me. They they're, um, really learn how to um, live in Missoula. And I appreciate that. And with all that has changed, all the doors that have closed, all the hours that have changed, all the lack of access to face-to-face -face connection. Um, and if you add not having a phone where you could connect differently. Um, so we say here, social, maintain social connection, physical distance. And they don't have the ability to connect socially with people by phone or computer. I think um, I can only imagine how much harder that is than those of us who have a phone and have minutes on our phone and have access to Wi-Fi. Thanks. I would also just uh, point out one more thing about this too. Sorry to interrupt you, Dave. Um, no. I think also things that we take for granted as well is when somebody's living outside, um, they do not have access to proper uh, sanitation to wash their hands and to use the restroom and all of that just adds another kind of health implication to folks who are trying to stay well outside. Absolutely it's it's difficult enough uh, as I can speak of having teenagers in the family to ensure that folks wash their hands etc uh, when there is water available so uh, it truly uh, the situation you've described it described uh, Amy and, and Lori certainly compounds challenges that many folks experience already. Lori, something that a lot of folks might be interested in knowing about is how in the work that you and your staff do at, at Partnership Health Center support individual rights and personal privacy in the context of a public health emergency like this. You know, it's been a really great challenge and I think we've risen to it. Um, the federal government and state governments have released a lot of the HIPAA requirements. And as we have reworked our systems, we have not lowered our bar. So um, we, as I have mentioned earlier, almost all our visits now are through the phone or computer. We have a small percentage that are face-to-face -face for folks that really truly need to be seen by a physician. Um, and we allow 
patients obviously choose what the setting is for their phone connection. Many of them are now meeting with us in their homes and we're finding that ability to connect with people in their homes is a really way, uh, interesting way to have them share their lives differently with us and probably a quite successful approach that we will use going forward. So the individual with whom we're connecting gets to decide the environment in which they receive the call. Um, and then we have all, all sorts of paperwork online where you can get consent, get information. Um, so it hasn't been as difficult as it sounds, except when you think about being homeless and if you're in a setting, assuming you have a phone, and again, we don't assume that, um, assuming you have a phone, if you can get a private setting where you feel comfortable uh, discussing your depression, your anxiety, your uh, oral health needs, or your primary care needs uh, is a challenge. And we help people find a place where they can feel comfortable sharing their lives. Thanks. And I think I'll open up this question to, to both of you and, and begin with, with Amy. We live in a, a generous, caring community here. Folks want to help. Folks want to reach out and do something, which is all the more challenging when we're socially distancing and staying at home. But uh, Amy, from your standpoint, is is there something specific that you would recommend, whether it's uh, related to the POV specifically or more generally that folks can do to help? I would say that the most uh, helpful thing at this time is the donation of funds. So if folks have, um, have extra money, if you don't need your stimulus check, um, think about sending it along to agencies like the Pavarello Center that are supporting folks in this very challenging time. I would also say we post a need of the week on our website and also on Facebook. And so that um, could be a need around toiletries or around socks or gloves, that kind of thing. So if you might, you know, if you're doing some cleaning in the middle of this pandemic, if you're bored, if you're one of those people that are bored, I haven't had that experience yet, unfortunately. Um, but uh, I would encourage folks to donate those items uh, to the Pavarello Center uh, to help us get through and make sure people's needs or basic needs are being met. Um, in addition, I think when um, these restrictions lift, think about uh, volunteering and giving back to your community in that way um, are big ways to help. Great. Lori, anything to add there? I would say, and as I watch us all, all behave sort of uh, in a, a strange fashion in Missoula, we tend to be so friendly and like to say hi. And I watch people when I'm outdoors avoiding eye contact and certainly avoiding um, that six foot um, circle, which is appropriate. I'm concerned about the social isolation that folks who are homeless are facing and also being ostracized in some, um, some camps, you know, not certainly across the board. And I, I guess I would really encourage people listening and watching to remember that we are all better together and that folks who are homeless are just like you and me, um, saying hello, asking how people are doing, um, asking if they need anything. I think um, I think that's going to be really important that we find our way back, back to each other and that we don't isolate subpopulations and make some people bad and some people good. And um, I, you know, I just I want us to start moving in that direction of being in this together. And it's feeling like we are moving in the opposite out of fear. Yeah, what a great reminder. Um, we are a community and uh, and let's take steps right now, even when we're physically distanced to recognize that we are all in this together and that we acknowledge our brothers and sisters who uh, uh, of any socioeconomic uh, category are, are in this together. So with that, uh, thanks so much, Amy and uh, and Lori, for joining us today. It's great work that both PHC and the POV do for our community. And uh, as we've said before in these uh, daily video briefings, uh, we will get through this and we will do it together. So uh, folks, be well, be safe, continue to social distance and uh, have a great day. And we'll see you back here tomorrow. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Amy. Thank you.